In 2008, Sibby had watched the TV documentary with Joanna Lumley called In the Land of the Northern Lights. And like so many other people, she fell in love with this natural, mystical, beautiful phenomenon. This is the most astonishing thing I've ever, ever seen. And so started her longing to visit the Scandinavian Arctic and find the Aurora Borealis. Every now and again, she hinted to her husband David and nagged him a bit to join her. But as he intensely disliked freezing conditions, it was clear it would not be him accompanying her. So he was off the list of invitees. Now, Sibby knew that I, her younger sister Monica, had thoroughly enjoyed a few summer adventures in Arctic Sweden. So one day Sibby approached me and asked if I would be interested in accompanying her on a search for the Aurora to celebrate her 70th and my 60th birthday. They fell a few weeks apart in 2021. Without a single thought, I enthusiastically said yes to the exciting prospect of a double celebration in the Arctic. We did some research and wondered whether to go to Tromsø, the city above the Arctic Circle in Norway, or maybe Arbisko in the Swedish Arctic. But eventually we were very excited to find the perfect, all-inclusive, holiday above the Arctic Circle in Finland. After some delay due to a small obstacle by the name of Covid, 2023 became the year for realisation. En route to the airport on Sunday the 12th of February, we felt very excited, if not rather childlike, about this special journey and we burst into a little song. We are family, I have got my sister with me, we are deaf to see, the northern lights in Levy. I'm afraid to say the theme of excited sisters was to continue throughout our trip. Our first Finnish destination was the Harineva Wilderness Hotel. On arrival, we were given a glass of champagne each to celebrate our birthdays. This marked the beginning of a very special week, one we would remember for the rest of our lives. We settled into our incredibly cosy rooms. But there was no time to slow down. We were immediately off to be given our winter outfits. A very fetching all-in-one, together with woolly socks, furry lined boots, gloves with liners, a balaclava. All to keep us snug and warm in the freezing Arctic temperatures. Then off to dinner. We were just about to tuck into our very first reindeer steak when our guide came to tell us that the aurora alert had gone off and we should go out immediately to see if we could spot it. We swiftly abandoned dinner, rushed to our rooms to grab our outdoor clothes and headed off to the Torno River, where, after a few minutes, we saw our first sighting of the glorious aurora borealis, a shimmering show of green moving like a satin curtain across the sky. We were transfixed and both so excited we could have stayed there all night. But our dinner awaited us in the restaurant. The next day the sun was shining and the sky blue and after our feast of a breakfast we headed to the safety briefing for the snow scooter safari, which we listened to carefully. This was going to be super exciting, a 30 kilometre trail transversing the snowy wilderness. Sibby designated me as the driver, which I was thrilled about, and a role I took on with great responsibility. And off we went, shooting through the beautiful landscape and across frozen lakes. We learned that huskies have the right of way above snowmobiles and watched patiently with our engines off while the husky sleds passed us. Now the snowmobiles aren't the easiest to manoeuvre, and on the way back, a young woman and her mother veered off the track and crashed into a fir tree. Luckily, no injuries were sustained other than a wounded ego. We all watched with interest as the undamaged scooter was towed out of the ditch, 
and we then continued our journey back towards Harineva with the sun low in the sky. Sibby asked one of our guides if these little accidents happened a lot. They do, apparently. A swift but delicious supper followed, then off to the sauna for a relaxing half hour before heading off on a snow train deep into the dark forest, to a clearing where we spent a couple of hours gazing at the sky, waiting and watching. Our patience was rewarded and a faint green light appeared in the sky, bringing us great joy and excitement. In the clearing was also a Finnish kota, a wooden structure with a fire pit used by Sami reindeer herders. And our guide had brought sausages for us to grill on the open fire. After all the frantic activity so far, we were pleased to have a free morning the next day and we headed out for a gentle stroll along the Torno River, which formed a shared border with Sweden on the other side. We had a bit of fun photographing each other modelling our warm coats. This was 14th of February and it was interesting to find out that in Finland on Valentine's Day you give cards and small gifts to your friends and receive them too. Nothing heart-shaped but instead small gifts for everyone you care about. We liked this way of celebrating the day. The main event of the day was dog sledding. I was the designated driver again and the very thorough safety briefing left us feeling slightly nervous about the excursion. The main tip was to make sure you keep your foot on the brake as you start and to keep your foot near the brake throughout to avoid the sled crashing into and injuring the huskies when we were travelling downhill. As we approached the farm, we could hear the excited yelps and barks from the huskies eagerly awaiting their day's outing as they were being harnessed and put in their positions in front of the sleds. Their excitement was overflowing and so was ours. We were ready for our 15 kilometre outing. The sled consisted of a chair on skis with a reindeer skin on it. Each sled was pulled by six dogs. Sibby made herself comfortable in the seat and I assumed my position as driver. By now the dogs were pulling, barking, yelping, tugging and raring to go. We took off as soon as the brake was released and with muscles bulging and enormous force and vitality, the competitive dogs charged off to keep up with the sleds in front of them. The first five or ten minutes were frenetic, but after this the dogs fell into a steady pace and all that could be heard was the swishing of the sled on the snow and the panting of the dogs. We wove our way through the silent, white, tranquil landscape, through forests and open fields and across lakes. The dogs had no chance to stop and were quite adept at doing their business whilst running and also grabbing a mouthful of snow to cool down when needed. It was one of the most magical experiences of our lives. The huskies were so very special. Once back home, the dogs immediately lay down to rest, exhausted but satisfied from their day's exercise. Later in the afternoon, we sat down with a cup of tea to glean as much information as we could in the Northern Lights workshop. We heard about the science, ancient myths and legends surrounding this natural phenomenon. After dinner, it was time to put our snowshoes on for a walk through the dark woods, weaving our way between the fir trees. Our head torches lit up the path and we chatted quietly, wondering if we might see another show of the aurora. A little while later we came into an opening and saw a familiar faint green glow in the sky. We stopped and watched the sky offer up a gentle, beautiful display for us. The guide for the evening had brought hot juice and biscuits and we stopped at a small shelter where he lit a fire and we enjoyed a break before returning, exhausted, back to our hotel and falling into bed. 
The next day was bright, sunny and glorious with expansive blue skies. The perfect day for snowshoeing in the Palace Ulusunturi National Park with its breathtaking wilderness scenery. The trees were covered with heavy snow, which formed wonderful shapes to inspire our imagination. Was that a person or an animal underneath all that snow? Now, Sibby and I thought we were quite fit, but four hours of snowshoeing proved to be a very strenuous activity, and our wonderful excursion left us feeling quite fatigued, with our leg muscles aching with the effort. So this was an excellent time for us to try the Arctic sauna and spa at Jerris. Now this Finnish sauna was one of the hottest we had experienced. And as we sat in the sauna, we gazed through the windows over a frozen lake, observing people walking and skiing across it. We noticed a hole in the ice close to the sauna. This formed a small swimming area for the intrepid, and we decided this was a must. So each of us braved the icy cold water for brief, invigorating and breathtaking dips. The cycle of hot sauna to icy lake was repeated six times by Sibby and four times by me. On one of my dips, I slipped on the icy steps as I entered the lake. This was all a sensation that cannot really be described, but we absolutely loved it. We then said goodbye to the wonderful Harineva and transferred by bus to the equally peaceful Levi Aurora village, hidden well away from the bright lights of the towns and busy ski resorts. We settled into our new homes, this time a cosy small cabin each, equipped with a half glass roof so you can lie in bed and watch the aurora. The roof is laser heated to ensure the snow melts and you have a constant view of the Arctic. The cabin's design is based on a traditional wooden quarter. But we had to wait to creep into our cosy beds because our first evening in Levy was spent aurora hunting in the wilderness by bus. We were hoping we would see a glorious repeat of the aurora, however, as the bus left the Aurora camp, it was snowing very heavily. The bus drove through the snowstorm and parked up in a clearing by the side of the road. Everyone piled out and a fire was lit and snacks and drinks were consumed. Sibby and I were a bit chilly so we arranged a disco, dancing and singing in the snow to keep warm. We wondered if that faint light in the distance was the beginning of a new sighting but this was a false alarm. The aurora was nowhere to be seen. The next morning, we enjoyed our sumptuous breakfast while being entertained by the most adorable red squirrels. We were both in love with these cute and cheeky creatures with their pointy ears. They were very adept at stealing food from the bird feeders. We also spotted a large bird with a red chest. And after researching it, established this was a pine grosbeak. The Finnish name was Taviokurna. Sibi and I both loved the lampshades in the restaurant. They were cleverly made from reindeer antlers. After breakfast, we embarked on a cross-country ski excursion and set off to do the circular route through the woods. Now, this was quite a tricky endeavour because skiing is not something I do very often. I had to find my balance and retrieve the skill that was hidden in my memory from many years back. I'm pleased to say I managed to do this surprisingly well. Oh, like Sibby though, who had never skied, had imagined it to be a skill easily yeah, learned, but was proved horribly wrong and after falling over three times, admitted defeat, returned her skis, 
knowing that she would never ski again. However, she donned some snowshoes and happily walked around the snow-covered lake while I reignited my love for cross-country skiing, swishing ecstatically through the woods. I must admit I can't wait to be back on skis again. We also had a little ride on the spark, which means kick, which is how you make it go forward. Later that day, we had the wonderful experience of a one kilometer reindeer sleigh ride through the wintry forest. We wrapped the blanket around us and settled into the cozy seat on the reindeer sleigh through the woods. None of the reindeer had antlers because reindeer shed their antlers every year. We pulled away at a gentle pace and could hear the clicking of the reindeer's legs as they trudged through the woods, caused by their tendons snapping over the bones in their feet. Experts believe this clicking helps a herd of reindeer stay in contact, especially in snowstorms or when it is foggy. Afterwards, we gathered in our reindeer herders quarter for a hot drink around an open fire and a very informative talk about the arduous life of a reindeer herder. Summers are spent getting the reindeer from the forest, by foot, marking them and releasing them back to the forest. They then prepare for winter. It can be as cold as minus 40 centigrade. Every house is warmed by wood, so they have to chop all firewood in readiness for the cold. They also prepare the winter food for the reindeer. The hay is cut and made into bales. Also for reindeer food, the herders cut down birch trees and put the branches in piles to dry over the summer. The leaves stay green and the reindeer eat this in the winter, together with lichen, also collected in the summer. One man in our group asked the herder how many reindeer he had and was told very firmly that this was an intrusive and rude question the equivalent of asking someone how much money they have in the bank. During our very first activity earlier in the week, we had been grouped together with an extended family of six people from Wales and Yorkshire. We instantly bonded with them, laughed a lot and became best friends during all our activities and excursions. We just loved the energy and optimism, their wonderful outlook on life and their generosity of including us in the group. On the last two evenings of the trip, we booked a private and hugely enjoyable sauna and hot tub experience with our new friends. And Sibby and I, the mad sisters, insisted on running straight from the sauna to make snow angels in our matching swimwear. That is cold. <laughs> and suddenly the day of departure had arrived. As our flight was in the evening, we made sure to make the most of this day. So we enjoyed another snowshoe walk, measured the depth of the snow, and even met an elf. And before we knew it, we were back to Kittala Airport and boarded the plane full of the most wonderful and happy memories of our Aurora Borealis 2023 dream that had absolutely come true.